Health Clinic, tonight on C-SPAN. Washington Journal continues. We want to welcome Louis Sorley, who's the author of the book, A Better War, The Unexamined Victories and the Final Tragedy of America's Last Years in Vietnam. Your book and the book by Gordon Goldstein, Lessons in Disaster, getting a lot of attention uh, over the last uh, week to 10 days. Has it surprised you? It's astonished me. The book was published 10 years ago, and for it to, to now be uh, given this attention is uh, really very surprising to me. Well, let me read to you uh, what uh, Peter Spiegel and Jonathan Weisman wrote this past week in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, again, pointing out that your book published in 1999, the book became a Bible to counterinsurgency experts in the debate over the Iraq war surged three years ago. Lieutenant General David Barno, who is the commander of the U.S. troops in Afghanistan until 2005, passed out the book to his staff saying, the first thing we did was tell people, read Louis Sorley's book. That's a recollection from Bernard Champeau, who was then a subordinate to General Barno. <laughs> That's, of course, very gratifying to an author. But uh, earlier on, I had some contact with General David Petraeus. Uh, he had a, a tour of duty overseas. Then he came back to Fort Leavenworth, and he convened a conference there to write a new counterinsurgency manual that was going to be jointly published by the Army and the Marine Corps. And uh, I was invited to a conference that he, he convened to help him prepare for that. He said, okay, you and I are going to be the keynote speakers. You're going to look to the past and I'm going to look to the future. So, uh, so we did that. And uh, that was a, a point at which I think some of the lessons in a better war began to be factored into uh, current contemporary thinking. Well, let me get to the essence of your book, and this is based on a piece that you're going to have tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal. You write, all the better known early works on the Vietnam War concentrated disproportionately on the early period of American involvement, the years when General William Westmoreland commanded U.S. forces. William Colby once remarked that the prevalence of such truncated treatments of the Vietnam War was like what Americans would know about World War II. If the histories of that conflict had stopped before Stalingrad, the invasion of North Africa, and Guadalcanal. Can you elaborate? Yes. Uh, the, the, probably the best known books about the war in the early period of writing about it were Stanley Carnile's book, uh, Neil Sheehan's book, and uh, George Herring, a very fine academician. And, and all those books were uh, uh, highly skewed to the first part of the war, the part especially 1965 when we put in major troop units to 1968 when the Tet Offensive occurred. Soon after Tet, General Westmoreland was replaced by General, General Abrams. Uh, in Sheehan's book in particular, it's uh, 725 pages, I think, and only 60 pages are devoted to the period from after Tet to the end of the war, even though uh, the nominal subject of his book, John Paul Van, lived and worked in Vietnam for four more, four more years. So my contention has been that uh, far from being a homogeneous whole, as we consider it, many people consider it because of the unbalanced, I'll say, treatment in the early well-known books, it was a much different war in the latter years under Abrams and William Colby and Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, a better war as I describe it. One other point from uh, this piece, again, which uh, you penned over the weekend, will appear tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal. When the last U.S. forces departed South Vietnam in March 1973, South Vietnam had a viable government and military structure that was positioned, had the U.S. kept its commitments, to sustain itself against renewed aggression from the North. When America defaulted, South Vietnam was doomed. We had made repeated commitments to the South Vietnamese uh, directly uh, from President Nixon to President Nguyen Van Thieu and through Ambassador Bunker and through other intermediaries such as Henry Kissinger that uh, and these were largely designed to induce the South Vietnamese to sign on to the Paris Accords which theoretically would end the fighting that if the North Vietnamese violated the terms of the accord and renewed their aggression, we would reintroduce combat power to punish those, uh, uh, those renewed aggressions, probably thinking primarily of B-52s. Secondly, we said that if there were renewed fighting, we would replace on a one-for-one -one basis losses of major combat systems by the South Vietnamese, things like tanks, artillery pieces, aircraft, 
and that was provided for in the Paris Accords. And thirdly, we said that we would maintain a robust level of financial support for the indefinite future. And, and in the event we defaulted on all three of those commitments, uh, a man named Tom Polgar was a CIA chief of station in, in Saigon at the, at the time. Uh, one of his last cables said, uh, outcome no, no longer in doubt, South Vietnam cannot survive without our support so long as North Vietnam continues to receive robust support from its communist backers. And that's what happened. As a lieutenant colonel retired, what's your background? Well, the lieutenant colonel retired is a long way in the background now. I served 20 years in the Army after graduating from West Point. I was an armor officer. I served in Germany, Vietnam, the United States. Um, I served several years at Central Intelligence Agency after that. I went to Johns Hopkins and uh, earned a doctorate in international affairs. But uh, beginning in about 1983, I, uh, I have been really living as a dinosaur in the period 1960, 1975, the, the period of the Vietnam War. I've written two biographies about people who were prominent uh, Army officers during that period, Creighton Abrams and another general named Harold K. Johnson. Um, for, I think I'm up to seven books now, but um, Vietnam continues to fascinate uh, me intellectually and emotionally as well. Well, let me, for the sake of the audience, because uh, the book did come out in 1999, it is uh, soon to be available in paperback. This is what the paperback edition looks like. You wrote, in Vietnam, Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, who you just talked about a moment ago, General Creighton A. Abrams, and Ambassador William Colby, fought as hard as they could for as long as they could with everything that was left with them to try to win the war. Maybe others in Washington or elsewhere were interested in a stalemate or disengagement, but these three men and the forces they led were striving for just one thing, victory. And victory would, um, would consist of a South Vietnam able to sustain its independence and determine its own political uh, and cultural future. So that, uh, that involved uh, building up South Vietnam's uh, uh, forces so that they progressively became more capable of uh, taking on the responsibility for their country's security. And uh, in the early part of the war, the, one of the major differences between the earlier and later parts is in the early part of the war, the emphasis was almost entirely on combat operations, ignoring uh, largely the improvement of South Vietnam's armed forces and ignoring the pacification of the enemy's infrastructure that was in the, in the hamlets and villages was keeping the South Vietnamese people under enemy domination. So uh, Bunker and Abrams and Colby said this has got to be one war. And they would capitalize that, one, one war. A war not just of combat operations, but also of upgrading South Vietnam's armed forces and of rooting out the covert infrastructure. As we said at the top of our interview, the other book getting a lot of attention is this one, Lessons in Disaster, McGeorge Bundy and the Path to the War in Vietnam. We talked this past week with the author Gordon Goldstein, and he draws the analogy between Vietnam and Afghanistan. Here's part of that interview. In Vietnam, we advocated a strategy of clear and hold. In Afghanistan, the strategy is clear, hold, and build. In Vietnam, we focused on the creation of what were called strategic hamlets for population protection. In Afghanistan, General McChrystal is advocating a strategy of population protection. Uh, in Vietnam, we decided that we needed to wage a classic strategy of counterinsurgency to win the so-called hearts and minds of the people. In Afghanistan today, uh, General McChrystal in his August 30 memoranda talks about winning the perceptions and the feelings and the allegiance of the Afghani people uh, to try to win uh, their support uh, to combat the insurgency there. Louis Sorley, your reaction to that comment? I, I watched Mr. Goldstein yesterday. I, I admired his uh, presentation very much. Uh, I, I can't help remarking that his book, like the others we spoke of earlier, deals with the early part of American involvement in, in Vietnam. You know, he, he takes as his major figure McGeorge Bundy. Uh, I, f I find his book and mine more complementary than, uh, than antagonistic. Um, what we need to know uh, when, we, when we consider analogies to Afghanistan in the current instance uh, 
is what was the real story of the other war that we're trying to make an analogy to or with. So when he talks about strategic hamlets and things like that, there were many failed pacification schemes in the early years, largely because uh, thrashing out around uh, in the deep jungle with uh, multi-battalion or multi-division forces uh, didn't do a whole lot for the security of the people in the hamlets and villages. And, and that's where the real war was being fought. In the early period, uh, the measure of merit prescribed by General Westmoreland was body count. Just kill as many of the enemy as you can. And his thesis was, if you killed enough, they'd lose heart and give up and go home. And of course, that never happened. We killed a horrifying number, but they just sent more down and kept, up, uh, kept on with what they were doing. In the later period, under General Abrams, the measure of merit became population secured. And, and all the focus was on the security of the people in these villages and hamlets. And once that was uh, uh, the, the area concentrated on, then lots of other good things could happen. Things that the South Vietnamese government could do for the people and for the economy. And uh, the, uh, there was a man named uh, uh, George Jacobson, began as an army colonel, a remarkable person. I served altogether 18 years in, in Vietnam. And, and he would be asked to brief visiting uh, dignitaries. His, his comment about uh, uh, pacification was, all the experts uh, uh, will tell you that security for the people is a, is a huge part of pacification. Some will say it's 10%, some will say it's 90%, but all will agree it has to be the first 10% or the first 90%. You can't do pacification with an NVA division tromping through the woods. And so uh, the later period was remarkably different in, in that respect. But to go back to Mr. Uh, Goldstein's uh, pr presentation, um, I, I would like to talk to him sometime because I think we would find ourselves in largely in agreement on the, the, the aspects of the earlier years that, uh, that he labels a disaster. Well, if we can work it out, we'd love to have the two of you on together and we'll open this network to a discussion and dialogue on both of the books. We're appreciative, appreciative of you being here on this Sunday. And as always, we welcome our viewers with their phone calls and comments. Also, you can send us an email. First up is Bill from Lockport, New York, a veteran of the Vietnam War. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Yeah, I find this uh, very interesting. And I was in Vietnam 70 and 71. December 1st, 1970, my outfit, the whole war changed. It was no longer seek and destroy, no longer victory. They were still sending us out in the jungle and we were supposed to try not to find the enemy. And if we were shot at, we were supposed to get for permission to shoot back, which we didn't. December 1st, 1970, the war changed for us. We lost a lot of people over there unnecessarily. And when we pulled out, thanks to Congress, we lost the war. If we would have won that war, we wouldn't be in the mess we are today with terrorism. You know, the story, uh, those are excellent comments because the story of the war is really sort of a, a mosaic that you build up from individual experiences uh, at different places in Vietnam and at different times in, in, Viet, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, someone once said that history is the, is the accumulation of in, innumerable biographies, and, and that's a brief biography. I, I served there in the earlier period, 1966 to 7, in, in a tank battalion up in, in what's called the Highlands. Uh, I came away with a whole different uh, perspective on the war than I now have as a result of you know, scholarly inquiries over almost three decades now. The, the thing that uh, many people uh, would say about General Abrams is what a tough job he had to command during a period of progressive withdrawal and, and how lucky we were to have someone like that there, or the things that Bill described, I believe, could have been even worse. And this is uh, a photo of Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker and General Abrams? Yes. Let's get to uh, another call. Angela from Aiken, South Carolina. Good morning. Good morning. And sir, thank you for your service. I have two quick questions. One, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not had America stayed in Vietnam, if the goals would have been achieved or if it was really a lost cause to start with, 
And how do you compare Vietnam to Afghanistan now as far as are we really, is the military really there to just to be nation building? And doesn't it require the people to want the help that the military offers? Thank you. Angela, the, those are the two key questions, uh, uh, wonderful questions. Uh, let me take the first one briefly. I, I'm so bold as to say in the book A Better War that there came a time at which the war was won. Uh, later on, of course, I have to explain why there came a time at which it was no longer won. And, uh, and uh, uh, Bill's uh, call touched on that point. The Congress decided that they were uh, sick of the whole thing and they uh, basically voted us out of the war. Had we stayed there, uh, I think the outcome could have been much different, but I don't think that it would necessarily have depended on our, our staying there. Had we kept those commitments that I mentioned earlier, I think the South Vietnamese had a reasonable chance of sustaining themselves. The fighting may have continued, but at a, at, at a let's say, a, a tolerable level and, and with their administration staying in power. Ambassador Bunker used to point out when uh, there was pressure here to withdraw American forces from uh, Vietnam that uh, many years after World War II we still had substantial forces in Europe and many years after the Korean War we still had substantial forces there and nobody was criticizing our allies there uh, for needing our help. So, uh, and for a long time there was a plan to keep a, re a residual force in, uh, in Vietnam but then that later went away. Now, the, Af the Afghanistan comparison, of course, is what, what, why we're here today, what we're, all, what we're all about today. The president and his senior national security advisors and senior military uh, uh, leaders are trying to determine what ought to be our future course of action in Afghanistan. Um, there are many, many differences between uh, Vietnam and Afghanistan, but there may be some similarities as well. The reason we look back before in, in order to look forward is to see what we can learn from our past experiences that might be helpful to us in the future. Uh, one of the things about Vietnam that I think is largely unrecognized is that they had a relatively viable government. They, they, uh, they had a, a popularly elected government. The anti-war uh, movement sought to discredit that government and they were largely successful in, in doing that in public opinion. But when the war ended and we saw uh, um, maybe two million people uh, abandoned their own co country because they did not want to live under the so-called uh, liberators of the communists. Uh, uh, we saw where the real loyalties of that co country lay. So if I were uh, advising those seeking to decide what to do now in Afghanistan, I, one of the places I would say to concentrate our attention would be on the on the current and potential future viability of the governing structure in Afghanistan. That's a key. A Twitter comment from this viewer who says, I agree that things did improve in South Vietnam, but I feel like in Iraq that we should not have gone in the first place. And again from Louis Sorley's piece that will appear tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal, quote, now when the commanders in chief and his advisors are contemplating future courses of action in Afghanistan, it is more important than ever that we have a clear understanding of what went well, along, of course, with what did not in such earlier cases as the Vietnam War. Analogies to the real history of Vietnam could be useful as those based on the flawed understanding of that conflict are dangerous and misleading. I, I think uh, making the case for a better war, as I, as I do in the book we've been discussing, is, is not the same as making a case for having for intervening in Vietnam in the first case, in the first place. Uh, I, I think that's a highly contentious issue on which it's uh, possible to to have a respectable view on either side of the issue. The, the one thing that should be said about that, though, is that the context in which the decision to enter uh, Vietnam was made was uh, one that's probably not uh, uh, too apparent to uh, many younger people today. It, it was in the context of the Cold War. Uh, it, it is true that there was a, an aggressive uh, uh, communist uh, movement that sought to expand its influence in many parts of the world. That um, not only the president who sent our forces in there, but several of his predecessors had viewed that as something America needed to be concerned about and needed to try to deal with. Uh, 
the, the uh, whole idea of containment uh, was very much in the minds of the people making the decisions then. And in fact, uh, early on, the entire Congress voted almost unanimously to um, back the president in his, in his introduction of force into, into Vietnam. Now, uh, what, are the, what are the cases here? To, what are the lessons here today? I mean, uh, some are obvious. Uh, one that I would focus on is uh, a president should not try to um, uh, move forward with military forces unless he's pretty well assured of the backing of the Congress of the United States. And, and, and he ought to do all he can to engender the support of the people of all political stripes bef before engaging in major military operations or um, escalating those that he's inherited. Th th those would be key things, I think. Uh, much of the criticism of Lyndon Johnson, which I find valid, is that he made no real effort to, to mobilize public opinion in support of the, ver the, st the successive steps that he took in, in Vietnam, and that we paid a high price for that. Kathleen Wright has this Twitter comment saying, what disturbs me is that we know that Vietnam and Iraq were based on lies, and yet no one goes to prison. The wars never end. We'll go to Stan in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Colonel. Uh, I, I know you've been retired for a while, but with all due respect, uh, I think we have a bigger issue here today, and uh, that, that issue is jobs here in America. It's the economy, stupid. Did you hear the comment? Yeah, I heard, I heard the comment. I'm not sure and I know how to respond. Uh, Stan, certainly a strong domestic economy is, is a, a high priority for any administration and in, in any period of time. Uh, I'll just comment that one of the big differences uh, between the period of the Vietnam War and the current period is in the position uh, and sourcing of our armed forces. We have an all-volunteer force now. Uh, we have a great armed force now. We're working them pretty hard. They're too small for the tasks that we, that we are giving them, and, and many young men and women are going back repeatedly to uh, combat zones, uh, placing a heavy burden not only on them, but on their families. In the Vietnam era, we still had the draft. Uh, many people think that that was a draft army that we fought the war in Vietnam with, but that's not, in fact, the case. Uh, about two-thirds of those who served during the Vietnam era were volunteers, only one-third draftees. Interesting contrast with World War II, the so-called Good War, uh, the greatest generation. Uh, two-thirds of those World War II uh, armed forces were drafted, only one-third volunteered. Next is a call from Cal, who's also a Vietnam veteran from Crokeville, Tennessee. Good morning, Cal. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Certainly. Uh, Colonel, I appreciate your service. Um, and also your books that you've written too. There are a couple things in Vietnam, uh, the war that I saw, and that I looked at and I searched, uh, researched later. I don't really think that uh, President Johnson, nor President uh, Nixon, were committed to winning the war. And the reason why I say that is because we never took the war to the North Vietnamese. We waited till later years when Nixon decided that he would find some way to bring stable. And the only way they would bring them to the peace table is if they bombed North Vietnam. I think if we had done that earlier, and we always had those, uh, those demarcation steps where we were uh, required to, uh, to only go so far, and we couldn't go across the border. We did have some covert actions in Laos and also in Cambodia, some things I knew about for sure. But I served with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, Airborne Infantry, and I, really don't, and I saw where the people came up to us later and said to us, we, you know, don't leave us in our area and don't put us with South Vietnamese because they're not ready. I'm afraid the Viet Cong will come back. But that's my comment. I think, my husband, we did not have the commitment to win. That's an excellent comment, and many people would agree with those judgments. In, in particular, during the uh, early part when Lyndon Johnson was still the president, uh, apparently there were two major factors influencing his, let's say, half-hearted commitment to winning the war. One was uh, uh, he didn't want the war to interfere with his so-called Great Society program, a domestic, uh, domestic program uh, 
And the other is that he appeared to be always very concerned that more aggressive action would bring China into the war as they had entered the Korean War uh, and, and, and caused great difficulties to, for us by, by doing that. Uh, he, may have been, uh, he may have been overly concerned about that, but uh, those, are, those were some of the things that, uh, that concerned him. Uh, the rules of engagement, that's a term I think you'll remember, were very restrictive in many ways. And uh, probably the most disadvantageous, and this continued through both periods of the war, early and late, was the prohibition against going into Laos and Cambodia and cutting that enemy supply line from the north and, and up from Sihanoukville in the south, known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, we did make one foray into Cambodia in 1970. It was very successful in its own terms, but it was limited by President Nixon in both in, in uh, depth of penetration and, uh, and time. And uh, so uh, General Abrams later said that uh, he, he considered it had been a, a minor uh, annoyance for the enemy. Let me ask you about General Abrams. This is one of the photographs that you have in the book uh, as he's briefing uh, a visiting Time Life group about this concept of one war. And from the book, you say General Creighton Abrams thought inc incisively about the enemy, about his objectives and what motivated him. Abrams admired their tenacity, logistical resourcefulness, and planning ability. Is that any different than any military commander? Or was it a different approach from oh, General Westmoreland? Um, well, I, I think it's, uh, I'm working on a Westmoreland biography now, so of course I'm very interested in his outlooks and motivations. I think it's fair to say that Westmoreland also admired the enemy in, in, in many respects. Uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, uh, though General Westmoreland continually asked for more and more uh, U.S. forces increment after increment, so we built up to well over 500,000 forces during his uh, uh, tenure in command. Uh, General Abrams had a much different set of, uh, of uh, problems to deal with because, among other things, we're progressively withdrawing our forces while he's in command. I think he may be the only major commander of an expeditionary force who, in effect, sent his troops home before him, sent his army home before himself. Uh, he he uh, he understood things about the enemy that I don't think General Westmoreland understood. Uh, um, he talked about the enemy's logistics nose, for example how the enemy had to preposition the wherewithal to conduct major campaigns, both in terms of, of troops and um, uh, ammunition and medical supplies and all the other, other things that you need. And he emphasized cutting off the enemy's logistics nose by locating those caches and seizing them before they could be used against American forces. So while he admired the enemy in many respects, uh, uh, he also understood them very well and and uh, figured out ways to deal with them. I, I want to quickly add that he did not, no one admired the political enemy because they were the ones who uh, uh, who relentlessly targeted civilians and, and assassinations and and uh, kidnappings and rocketing of civilians in cities and so on. We're, we're talking about the military versus the political. We're talking with Lewis Sorley. The book is called A Better War, and we welcome Evelyn to the conversation. She's calling from Bedford, Texas. Good morning on the Democrats' line. Yes, I intend to get your book, but I think Obama is rather in the same spot that uh, Johnson was in. It was a no-win situation, and he was be damned if he did and be damned if he didn't. And I firmly believe that Bush went into Iraq so that he would, could be near uh, I mean, into Afghanistan so he could be near Iraq. I think that was well planned. Agree or disagree with that? I don't know what the motivations were uh, for uh, as tying those two together. It seems to me that uh, as much as the Cold War dominated the period that, that I've concentrated on, the, the Vietnam era and uh, really all of my service, uh, so the war on terrorism dominates all considerations today. Um, the, the calculations that have been made by uh, successive administrations and their advisors, uh, I think, have been dominated by concerns to protect America and its allies against uh, repeated uh, terrorism and, to, and, if possible, to uh, uh, take away the base of support for I international terrorism. Carmen, joining us from Hamilton, Montana. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Um, my, my experience in Vietnam, um, 
I I felt that um, the same as uh, the second second George Bush said weapons of mass destruction. After serving in Vietnam, I know the war was a big lie. I know the Tonkin Gulf incident never happened. But what did bother me when I was over there, since the cat is out of the bag now about Abu Ghraib and everything, is um, uh, uh, Colonel, are you is is, is Mr. Uh, William Colby your friend? Is who? Just one. Mr. Colby, is he your friend? Well, uh, Mr. Colby was my friend. Yes, uh, he's gone now, as you know. Uh, I I think that most historians now uh, who have looked at all the records that seem to be available uh, conclude that the first Tonkin Gulf episode uh, uh, did in fact take place. That the second one, two days later, was probably a misreading of um, of other things on the radars. And, and I think the skipper of that ship w would, uh, would, would say so now. But to make a, a blanket statement that the involvement in Vietnam, which is the one I know about, uh, was based on lies is, uh, is a little extreme, probably. We do know, and I'm sure that, that that's what the, uh, Carmen has in mind, uh, that there were many times when Lyndon Johnson did not level with the American people. Uh, he apparently wanted to uh, play the war on the on the uh, quiet, so that he would not lose support for his domestic programs, and and he would uh, uh, say that we're sending this increment of troops, at, when he already knew that a larger increment was in was in the offing and things like that. This led, as, as I'm sure Carmen and others know, uh, uh, to what was widely called the credibility gap. And, and, and no commander in chief, uh, in my view, no leader of any at any level, uh, can uh, be very effective if if he's not believed by the people he's trying to lead. So, uh, I I hope that we won't fall into that uh, trap again. Our next call is from Mandeville, Louisiana. Good morning, Chris. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Car Colonel Surly. I'm a retired Army Colonel. I uh, served uh, in. Uh, career on the DMZ, uh, Desert Storm, uh, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, multiple tours. I was part of the planning group that re revised the original war plans for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, I can tell you there were some extreme, extremely heated discussions that went on during the planning process over the force structure, especially on the logistics side especially with the regard of uh, contractors on the battlefield, the reduction of the number of MP battalions, both for the 800th MP Brigade and the 220th that we had uh, requirements for uh, MSR security. Uh, there was a lot of discussion placed on this. Um, in fact, I, I was one of the people that helped coin the fr uh, phrase, the bootlegs war and war on the cheap. I can tell you I got many heated discussions with general officers on on this situation. We went from a a concept of uh, desert storm of overwhelming force of uh, of hitting the enemy and smothering the enemy the way it should to one where hey we're going to run this war and make it on uh, uh, do it faster and cheaper than what desert storm was was conducted. Colonel, thank you for your call. We'll get a response from Lewis Sorley. First of all, let me say I admire your service in all those multiple uh, venues. The heated discussions that uh, you refer to are, are very interesting to me because, uh, among other things, uh, some friends of mine have both told me that discussions involved whether to deploy with their, uh, their heavy armor, for example. Uh, force structure is a key. And I've been fascinated by the uh, heavy reliance on contractors in these conflicts that we're now, that now, we're now talking about. Uh, I uh, said earlier that I thought our, our forces overall, especially the Army, were too small for the missions and the, and the operational tempo that we have assigned them now, and that that's caused us to rely more uh, on reserves than we ever had contemplated doing. Uh, one of the things that, that seems to me uh, pertinent to the comments that you made is, uh, what's your timeline? In, in Vietnam, uh, uh, General Westmoreland, to his credit, uh, 
uh, oft, often talked about a force structure there that could be sustained for the long haul. And, uh, and that meant being sustained logistically, being sustained in terms of the rotational base of forces, but also, and more importantly, being sustained by the support and uh, willingness to back it of the American people and of the, of the Congress and the administration. Uh, I, I hope those considerations are going to be high on the agenda as, as we contemplate what to do next. Two books getting a lot of attention uh, this past week. Our guest featured here at the table, Louis Sorley, the other book that we featured earlier this week on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, Gordon Goldstein's Lessons in Disaster, both available online at booktv.org, including past events that we've covered with Lewis Sorley for Book TV when his uh, book came out and also a reprint back in 2007. And our next call is from Kevin in Raleigh, North Carolina. Good morning. Good morning. Um, um, I guess one of the concerns that I have is the, the public relations effort that's been made on behalf of Vietnam, um, then Iraq, then Afghanistan, not necessarily in that order, because we were always told things like there's, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, um, and that, um, you know, we're around the corner, and I can remember vividly, you know, how uh, the American people were sort of um, uh, being comforted by the fact, by these words, that there, you know, that, um, that there would eventually be you know, victory and an end to this. And I think that I remember also in November of 2006 at a press conference, President Bush was asked, are we winning in Iraq? And he said, of course we are. And then in January of 2007, there was the need for the surge. I think there's a point at which that someone, particularly flag officers who serve near or around the Joint Chiefs, have to deal with us honestly and have to deal with the President honestly. Someone has to say, you know, this isn't going well. We've got to do something else. Um, and I think, you know, that, um, that even with the things that in the later part of the Vietnam War, the prospect that, you know, we would have more Operation Linebackers and Rolling Thunders that kept bombing the North and bombing the, um, uh, the, the, the Viet Cong, it, you know, there is the distinct likelihood that that war could still be going on today. Kevin, we'll get a response. Appreciate the call. I think we may need to make a, a distinction in responding to Kevin's comments uh, similar to the one I sought to make in, in the better war between the earlier and later periods in Vietnam. Uh, during 1967 in particular, the uh, Johnson administration orchestrated what uh, historians now often call the progress offensive, in which they sought to uh, convince the American people that things were going very well in, in uh, Vietnam. And, and General Westmoreland came back to the United States uh, three times during that uh, that year and he spoke to at the National Press Club and he addressed a joint session of Congress and he went to the uh, AP editors uh, uh, luncheon and so on and he did say things like what Kevin uh, referred to uh, he said I've never been more encouraged in my four years in Vietnam and nearly four years in Vietnam and he said things like we have reached the point where the end begins to come into sight and then when in uh, just a few months later in end of January 1968, the Tet Offensive erupted all over Vietnam and was all over everybody's television screens here, a lot of people reached one of two conclusions. Either General Westmoreland hadn't been leveling with them, or he didn't know what he was talking about. And, and I don't know which is the more damaging of the, of the two critiques. In the later period, though, Creighton Abrams never never made any optimistic predictions of that kind. He said in one of his first messages to his new subordinates after he took command, uh, we, will, uh, we will let results speak for themselves. Well, on that point, would Lieutenant Sorley please comment on the validity of the domino theory as the reason for the U.S. intervention in Vietnam? A lot of people subscribe to the domino theory. The domino theory, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, held that if uh, South Vietnam fell uh, other nearby nations would fall as down dominoes that had been stood up one after another might fall if you push the first one over. They feared then the rest of Southeast Asia would go and then maybe the Philippines or maybe Indonesia. Uh, by go, I mean fall under communist influence and, and this is all part of the larger Cold War competition that we, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, when South Vietnam did fall to the communists, so did Laos, so did Cambodia, but fortunately, uh, uh, no, no other nations in the, in the region. Uh, 
I talked about this once with Walt Rostow, who had, had served Mr. Johnson. I, I said, um, uh, could it have been, been the fact that uh, because uh, we, uh, uh, we did sustain the South Vietnamese for as long as we did, although they eventually felt that the potential other dominoes became no longer dominoes during that period, and, and he agreed that that, that that made some sense. After the Tet Offensive, as many uh, will know, Lyndon Johnson uh, took himself out of the presidential uh, race, said he would not stand for re-election, and a, a bitter joke at the time was that that proved the domino theory, even though only one domino fell, and that domino was Lyndon Johnson. Jay is joining us from Louisville, Kentucky, with author Louis Sorley. Good morning, Jay. Good morning. Just a quick question, sir. Uh, sure. Uh, I wonder if they use the same kind of strategy that where they try to draw fire into the, you know, against civilians, you know, just so they could draw, you know, anger, you know, make the civilians more angry against uh, American troops, you know, like the uh, modern Muslim terrorists do. That that's that's a, a very interesting point. I, I'm not confident to to comment on that with respect to current uh, uh, operations. But in the Vietnam War, that was certainly a, a factor. When General Abrams took command, one of the first things he told his uh, uh, subordinates was, my problem is colored blue. And by that, he meant it involved friendly forces, which as military people know, are usually portrayed on battle maps in blue, as opposed to the enemy that are portrayed in red. My problem is colored blue. And by that, he meant that the way operations had been being conducted resulted in far too much spillover of combat wherewithal onto the people that we were supposedly trying to protect. At one point, he even convened a study that was called, Where Should We Let Peace Come to Vietnam? And by that he meant, where are the regions of this country where, because of their hev they are heavily populated or they are largely pacified, we should not use heavy firepower like artillery and, uh, and, uh, air, and close air tactical air support. Uh, and that had a major impact on that. Uh, so as the war uh, uh, continued, the uh, efforts to, to keep the enemy from being able to lure us into, let's say, disproportionate tactical responses that would have the effect of harming the very people we were supposed to be protecting, and by the way, also alienating them from the government that we were hoping to, that they would adhere to, uh, became more and more important, and I think progress was made. At its peak, in excess of 500,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam and almost 54,000 casualties as a result of the war. Let me just read one other excerpt from your book. Under the new leadership, both in Washington and Saigon during the latter years, a wholly different approach came about, one in which population security, not body count, was the measure of merit. An attitude of nurturing and improving the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese armed forces rather than basically shoving them out of the way and concentrating on one war. The one war, as we've said before, a concept shared by General Abrams, Ambassador Bunker, and Ambassador Colby, was that if you don't succeed in all the dimensions of the war, then you're going to fail overall. And those key dimensions were the ones that we've talked about. Combat operations, yes, but much different in the latter years than in the early years. Support for building up the South Vietnamese for armed forces so they could progressively take over responsibility for their own security as we progressively withdrew our forces and rooting out the communist infrastructure in the hamlets and villages that was using terror and coercion to keep the populace under you know, en enemy domination. So uh, as, as the war progressed uh, and we, we tried to advance on those three fronts, we reached the point where I, I as I said, emboldened to say that there came a point at which the war was won after we defaulted on our commitments and the enemy continued to get very uh, robust, in fact, greatly increased support from its communist backers, that, that viable approach, of course, was undermined and, and the war was lost. Our last call comes from San Diego. Mike, a Vietnam veteran, good morning. Welcome to the program. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Colonel. <clears throat> yes, sir. I'm um, uh, 68, 69, and 70. 68, I was in the Mekong Delta down there with the uh, 9th, um, uh, 9th Infantry Division, uh, 93rd Combat Engineers. 
and uh, 69 and 70, I was in Cambodia and Laos. Uh, from my recollection, uh, we had cut off the supply on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We had both sides cut so they couldn't ambush. My unit was directly responsible for two NBA hospitals that we pulled out of the ground and airshipped them out of there. We captured more enemy troops, more uh, uh, combat troops, more weaponry and uh, ammo than any other unit in the history of the war. And we didn't care because we were combat engineers. But we remember clearly the Congress cutting off the Democratic Congress cutting off the funds so we couldn't go any further when we had them right there. Which is part of the essence of your book. Yes, yes it is. So thank you, Mike, for those good comments and, and also for your good service. The, uh, the frustrations uh, of not being, after, uh, uh, being able to go after the enemy when, when uh, we could have perhaps decisively ended that conflict are ones that every soldier, every so sailor, Airman, Marine involved uh, uh, must have felt. I certainly did, and, and those frustrations continue uh, even to today. But, but I want to also point out that in the later period, the period during which you served, uh, because we concentrated not just on combat operations, but also on the other factors that we've discussed here, especially building up South Vietnam's armed forces, uh, there, there, there emerged a viable uh, uh, means of con conducting the war that did not depend on uh, changing the rules of engagement in, in major ways. As we've discussed, that, that incursion into Cambodia was of limited duration, limited uh, uh, depth of penetration. It, it achieved a lot, but Abrams said uh, in, in the end it was uh, basically a raid. Uh, but but, but uh, we did position the South Vietnamese so that uh, they were able to, by the time of the 1972 uh, Easter offensive with only uh, naval gunfire and air support from us to, to turn back an invasion of uh, the equivalent of uh, approximately 20 divisions. Turn it back and inflict such heavy con uh, casualties on the enemy that it was three more years before they could mount uh, another major offensive. By then, of course, we had totally withdrawn and the Congress had basically uh, uh, written off the South Vietnamese and they were no longer able to sustain themselves. A very sad outcome. The subtitle, The Unexamined Victories and the Final Tragedy of America's Last Years in Vietnam. Our guest has been Louis Sorley, who's the author of the book, A Better War. Thanks very much for joining us. It's been my pleasure, sir. Both this book with Louis Sorley, in case you missed uh, the entire interview and want to watch it, and also our conversation with Gordon Goldstein, who's the author of the book, Lessons in Disaster.